uh, beforeourtime.ca. So if you guys want to check out the stuff he's been capturing, that's where to go. Cool. And yeah, thanks, David. That's really cool. And that's cool you got stuck down there during the, <laughs> during the lockdown. <laughs> what a place to get stuck, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this one's called... Uh, I think this is also from Jim. This is called Oyante Tambo School of Rock Shaping. <laughs> Oyante Tambo looks like it might be a training site for stone cutters. The soft limestone is not really good for quarry stone, but a good practice material. I was a firefighter for 28 years, and when we had training with the jaws of life, we would tear abandoned cars apart on the training ground. With the jaws, it was easy, and we would leave a mess of twisted steel that somebody unfamiliar with the mechanical rescue tool system we were using would look at the aftermath and ask, WTF happened here? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Really interesting idea. And yet it gives you uh, an understanding of the tools so that when you actually go to do it in the real uh, scenario, you know how to use it without, you know, like you know how to use the tool properly without yeah. Yeah. getting the results you want. And that's why some of it looks results. whimsical, right? They're practicing yeah. out there yeah. in the mountains, cutting with yeah. the, with the Very old cool. shamir. Great connection. Yeah. Love it. He also says, oh, yeah, remember to consider your Australian fans. There are no snakes, snakes down under. There are snikes. <laughs> <laughs> spelled S-N-I-K-E-S. That's not a snike. Snikes. <laughs> Thanks again. Love what you guys are doing. <laughs> snikes. <laughs> snikes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> this is from John. <laughs> it's called... <laughs> It's called Howdy from the Not-So-Frozen-Anymore North from John. Howdy, howdy from Minnesota. You can say my name on the podcast if you read this. First, my only regret is I did not find your podcast sooner. You guys kick ass and your music is slick. Hey, thanks, buddy. Second, I do, not know how much, I do not know how much fiction you read, but your musings have brought me back to a story by H.P. Lovecraft. Actually, two of them. At the Mountains of Madness and the Shadow Out of Time. Yes. Dude, those are two of my favorites. <laughs> two of my favorites. <laughs> the Shadow Out of Time is about a man whose spirit gets pulled into the past and placed in the body of a species that ruled Earth in the past, and he gives a short paragraph to other beings that ruled and would rule Earth. It is fascinating to think about this kind of thing, and I would love to hear your thoughts on the book. It is short and easy read, thankfully, because big words are hard and the Marines didn't teach me to read goodly. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so, okay. The Shadow Out of Time, to give a, let's see. Uh, he, okay. The story, basically, the premise of the story is this guy, suddenly his personality totally changes. And then he becomes, he starts traveling all around the world. He starts giving, con he seems to be much smarter. And he becomes much more interesting. And he starts to get in, like, like he goes all, uh, uh, Comte de Saint Germain, like he starts yeah, yeah. getting in with all the top people, and he's talking to people, and this it lasts for I don't know four years or something. Uh, and then he changes back, right, to who he was before, and he has to the person what well, after he changes back, he starts he has to, he has to recover this lost four years because he doesn't remember anything. He's just like suddenly he's somewhere else, and his life is different. <laughs> he's like, what the hell. And then he starts having, he asks around and he finds out that he did all this stuff during all this time. And he has nightmares also uh, about crazy things. And eventually he begins to learn to, I can't remember if he gets hypnotized or he learns to explore his nightmares, but he basically finds out that what happened to him, the, the premise is, is that in the deep past, there was a totally different civilization of earthlings that were like, think old ones. They were very powerful, psychic, they... They totally were not bipedal hominids. They were something completely different living in the Carboniferous era of ancient Earth. And they, bec they became extremely technologically advanced. And one of the researches that they used to do was reach out into the future and grab on to some intelligent being there and swap spirits. Right? So they would send one of their spirits into that person's body way in the future to learn about what earth was going to be like way out, what way long after them. Meanwhile, that person would get snatched back into their time and inhabit one of their bodies. Right. So over time, the guy recovers his memory of being this crazy, like 
cephalopod like thing from the ancient past and exploring their libraries and they get him to write down some of his he learns about them he learns that they're actually afraid of the ruins of an even more ancient civilization oh, man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you throw that in there. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, you know, I I don't. I've, is it weird to give spoiler alerts on 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 a story that's like a hundred years old? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but go read the story. Go read the story because the end is the is the part that you want to hear to read. Uh, so yes, I love that story. I love it. And there there are audio versions available that you can find on YouTube because people have read them. You know, H.P. Lovecraft cool. is in the uh, yes. And then the other one that he mentions is the Mountains of Madness, and that one is a. Uh, a story about exploring. I, I can't remember if it's Antarctica or the Arctic. I think it's Antarctica. And the same thing happens. They find not the same thing, but they find evidence of the old ones there, yeah. like a very ancient civilization living in our, in our, they start finding their artifacts and they find an entrance that goes down into the city. That's now completely buried. And it, it drives them crazy because it's so weird, you know, hmm. <laughs> It sounds great. <laughs> and it's the same deal. They find out that those ancient beings who are terrifying to us were terrified of something even older. It's, it's classic <laughs> HP Lovecraft. <laughs> he says, finally, if this is not too long, you've given me a new lens to look at the world through. The North Shore of Lake Superior has always been one of my favorite places to go, but I never considered how it, how it became such a stunning landscape until I heard you talk about how the earth changes. So thank you for opening my eyes to this. If you are ever in Minnesota... Or want to check out what we have up in the north? Don't hesitate to reach out. You have a snake friend up here now. Really, finally, I sent you some fossils from the Tibetan Plateau a few months back. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, here they are. And I always they assumed they got there when India crashed into China. But could those deep sea fossils have landed there due to a catastrophic flood? Anywho, keep kicking ass, laughing, and making music. Snakes! From John. <laughs> Thanks, John. And yeah, you know, uh, old History Shift is out there, too. So uh, you guys ought to... Hang out if you haven't already. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, There's another one from Jim. <coughs> okay, on episode 188, Ben says he doesn't know where the slab of rock came from. It looks like it was precision cut and pulled from the rock face above and to its left. Then left for display as a trophy or example, supporting this training theory I had. I wonder what the measurements are of this slab in the cutouts. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, yeah, he's he's watching the swap casts and commenting on them, basically. Yeah, I, I, I know what slab of rock you're talking about. It's it's like that flat, it's like it looks like a tabletop. It's kind of leaning up. Against, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in the Serapium. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it's in Peru. Oh, in Peru. Yeah. It's up in the mountains. It's like leaning up against, it's like a random, beautifully cut slab of rock leaning up against an area. And I asked, I was like, where did that come from? Oh. He's like, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Um, uh, I was thinking of the um, the doors in the therapy. Oh yeah, the slabs of uh, granite that are yeah. just leaning up. Yeah, well, I th yeah, I think Jim is saying that he thinks it was that slab. It's in Peru. It's leaning up. He thinks it was just cut out of a nearby rock okay. that he could see. Possibly, Jim. I don't know. I think that uh, my instinct is that Ben would have known about that if that's what people that's if that's clear. But maybe you're right. Who knows, man? Uh. Okay, this is called Wine and Catastrophism from Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Serpents. My name is Ryan, and I am an avid fan, a listener, investigator of your work and your colleagues, and I'm so honored to be able to have the opportunity to follow you guys and enjoy everything you're doing. I am also a beverage enthusiast and started a project of hard cider making in rural Maine, and we are looking to do a lot of synchronicity as far as blending grapes into the cider. Listening to your passion with your grapes, we're doing a very similar thing, cultivating growing here on the property. But I would be wondering if you would recommend any Texas grape vineyard that sells juice or must that you guys would recommend thinking, uh, recommend thinking that I follow you for your knowledge about catastrophism. I would wonder if you had any recommendations on wine to follow. I appreciate your time very much and thank you for all your work. Keep it up and enjoy the ride from Ryan. Well, um, not the vineyard specifically, but maybe contact William and Chris winery. Ask them. Um, because they do source, uh, <coughs> you know, grapes, fruit from the high plains in Texas. And also they have some local vineyards and Bill Blackman is, uh, one of the best 
authorities on growing grapes. Yes. And so even when it comes to vineyards that they don't own, as the as the winery that's buying the fruit, they have uh, they play a big part in the growing of the of the grapes. And he knows how to take care of them and uh, get a good product. So check out William and Chris. Bill Blackman is the William, yeah, of William and Chris. Um, so that's one. Uh, and then another company that we are uh, actually entering into a. Uh, sort of a partnership. It's, cus- it's called Custom Crush. Um, they're called Slate Mill, and they have a very big operation. Uh, they do Custom Crush, so they. I, I'm not sure if they will source the fruit for you. They might, though, if you're... I just don't know about transporting, right? Transport uh, Transportation of the fruit is, is... Because we're harvesting in August, it's very hot. Yeah. And so, so if the fruit... has to be cooled or, or has to go quick. Yeah, if the fruit gets hot it's uh, it's no good that's bad news so um so yeah you need to pre-order and they need to know that they're going to send you cooled fruit all the way to maine yeah that's a long way yeah i was talking about like 30 hours of driving yeah Yeah. you know for a trucker it's going to be more so i mean maybe the best bet would be to um have the winery make the wine first, just simply get it through uh, primary fermentation. Once it's through primary fermentation, then it could be much, I, I think it would be much easier to ship uh, in a refrigerated truck. Yeah. Maybe he doesn't need that much. He wants to add it to their cider or something. Yeah, it also depends on how much you're making, because if you're, if you're making, uh, if you're doing like batches in your garage or something, then maybe we can just send you some. Just get a big uh, cooler and throw some dry ice in there and ship it to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know. Um, it's interesting. So, yeah, let us know uh, what your, what, what, let us know more details. Yeah. All right. Are we done? I see we're over, over three hours here. We got still. Yeah, we went a little long on a couple of the segments, yeah. but I, I, I wanted to talk to you, all you people out there. Those of you who donate to the show, I do want to start doing um, the producer credits and, um, um, you know, executive producer and associate executive producer credits. Yeah. Similar to what Ben's doing. So, and I'm not sure how to work this out as far as the, um, you know, the Patreon versus uh, PayPal. What I see is PayPal. Russ, Russ sees the Patreon. So we'll figure that out. My point is, if you donate fifty dollars or more, um, we're I'm I'm basically going to want to read that your full name out, right? To give you the producer credit, we're going to put your full name in the credits um, of the show. Yeah. Right. So. And they'll go in the show notes as well. Yeah, as, it'll be in the as, show notes as executive and associate so executive producer. So if you want to be anonymous and you're going to donate, uh, you're going to do a donation of fifty dollars or more. Then make sure to put a note, like if you send it, if, if it's PayPal, there's a way to put a note in there, say, keep me, you know, anonymous and I'll just, we'll just, you know, I mean, I don't know how you give a producer credit to anonymous. Yeah, we, we can't, can't do we it. Can't. Yeah. So yeah, if you're not cool with that, just say, keep me anonymous and we won't give you the producer credit. We will thank you on the show. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, we are going to start doing that and I still have to give Russ the, uh, the the names from the last show yeah and so was, and i and i didn't say that you know prior to those donations so just like if if you're one of those people from the last show that i was saying we're going to give uh producer credits to and you do not want your name put in the show notes in full then let us know yeah that's right that's right and um we also have to work out how to get the Patreon content over to the PayPal donors, which is something I still have to figure out. It can't well, be done as far as I know. Yeah, I think that uh, I have access to their emails through PayPal. So I can actually, like, this... We'll yeah, take the a question is, is, will I be able to get Patreon to give me this, the feed code for to give to people? And will it work on yeah. multiple people's devices? Yeah. Because the Patreon content is going to go up on a Patreon feed, 
basically. And and every Patreon, every patron on Patreon gets their own custom feed code for that feed. 